Gabriel's message of hope, messages of hope. And I hope that as I go through this, it'll become more clear what I mean by that. And there's so many links here to so many of the elements we've heard all week that it just continues to astound me um, how God's hand is in this. But I'm fairly certain that many of us have experienced that feeling uh, that something external to our, our own dexterity has saved our lives or um, saved us in a moment of, which could have gone in a very, very bad way, uh, a very critical time, um, perhaps in relation to even driving a car. Uh, that moment when we maybe should have been broadsided by a truck and somehow, some way, it was avoided. Uh, our families and friends, our families, uh, those of us together, would understand better, but our work colleagues would just tend to say things like, yeah, you're really lucky, and uh, okay, that's where it might end. But as believers in the one and only Savior who gave his life for us, there is, not, there is no other explanation um, that what we will get into. And someday, if I'm blessed with the courage and the strength and conviction and follow God's commandments to obey and follow his ways, I may be able to even ask um, what happened that day on Highway 287 outside Broomfield, Colorado. Um, yeah, so this actually did happen to me. It's not a big deal by any means, but I was following a visit with my parents. If I recall, Shelley was at the feast, and I was not yet in the church, and worse, I was pretty much of a jerk and hostile about the, the church and the holy days. And um, I had my car full of, um, John will appreciate this, Parmesan Reggiano from New York City that um, my parents had gotten a big, big load. Uh, but a road that had been previously a two-way turn the day before had turned into a one-way turn. And a lady traveling south in her large truck uh, didn't understand that change had occurred and so she turned right in front of me and we were going at high speeds and rather than hit head on which was the obvious um, conclusion um, I was able to just swerve slightly and of course the Audi I was driving was nearly total it wasn't total but ironically even the airbag didn't go off because of the corner that I that I hit but the point was I survived with no in, no injuries and the lady's truck was just fine as well, but it should have been a disaster, and it wasn't. Now, we who believe in God and His Son, Jesus Christ, know that we can turn to Scripture to gain a more likely explanation for these moments. But we should not misunderstand and expect that claiming belief in God is somehow an insurance policy that places a safety net around us each moment of each day. We will be, and we are tested, and bad things can happen to people who are baptized believers and are actively repenting and growing. It's just, it just happens. As much as we do not like this, it will simply come along with the mantle of choosing to accept God's invitation to draw us to Him. He and Jesus must ultimately know that they can trust us, they will not be, they, that we will not run at the first raindrop of the storm but we will ride it out with courage. There's nothing wrong with the fact that we may struggle. That's part of being a human being and the fact that we are not yet what we hope to be. But in that struggle, we must learn to eventually struggle less and less and gain more and more trust in God. And perhaps one difficulty for us is that God had his own, has his own plans for us and his own timetable that we cannot understand and will depart from our own envision of what that means. Learning to accept that requires faith, repentance, and acknowledgement that we have the problem. But as baptized believers, we're working to obey each and every one of God's commandments that we receive, so we receive an extra measure of God's protection, though we may not be spared from each trial and possible uh, problem or harm, we have opportunities to be above the fray and stand as one who has put on the whole armor of God as we read, and you don't need to turn here now, but in Ephesians 6 and verses 10 through 20. For this is the only way that we can possibly withstand the wiles of the devil. And I think that speaks to a conversion and a repentance. 
But let us consider Psalm 91, and I would ask you to turn there with me, and specifically in verses 9 through 13. For context, the section is entitled, Safety of Abiding in the Presence of God. And we know that, that David has a way with, with words, and inspired, obviously, a way. So reading in verse 9, because you have, and I believe I was uh, reading in the NIV for this version, believe, because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give, you, give his angels charge over you to keep you in your ways. Verse 12, continuing, in their hands they shall bear, bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra. The young lion and the serpent shall tramp, trample underfoot. And I just will read this quickly uh, from a different translation. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. So that should give us, those of us who are facing trials, even here together at the feast, some additional measure of hope for what we're facing. But much like Mr. Amorelli uh, yesterday, I've been considering the book of Daniel quite a bit lately. And, and uh, to, um, to Mr. Mitchell, I think Daniel may be one of those giants of the Bible. But I didn't use that title. It had been taken. Um, but he is a giant to me. And, and uh, I've been struck by the um, in the book of Daniel, by the actual appearance of the angel Gabriel, and I'll, and I'll tell you why. And again, the, go back to the beginning of my title, Gabriel's Messages of Hope, and why, why he did appear to Daniel. We know that Gabriel appears in the Bible on really not many occasions, but very critical occasions. And these were not necessarily the car crash moments that I mentioned, although I will get there because I think there is one that John mentioned that I think is appropriate. But there were occasions in which there could be no room for miscommunication insofar as what God was intending and also what he wanted communicated. But back up just a bit and remember that Daniel was deported to Babylon at the age of 16, and he was handpicked by the, by the, the leaders of, those, of Babylon for government and service to the king, kings, plural. We know that Daniel's true role, his true role, not his uh, imprisoned role was to be a prophet for God and deliver his words and a sense of the future to both Gentiles and the Jews of the day. Let's consider Daniel 8 that begins with the third year that Belshazzar was king. And I admit to having some trouble with some of the king names of the kings that came during Daniel's time. But this is Bel Belshazzar was king and Daniel was interpreting the king's dreams. We know that part. We know that very well. Daniel had had a cataclysmic dream concerning a ram with horns so powerful that this creature could not be stopped. Daniel was puzzled, and he heard a voice cry out from across the river that he was standing at for the man who was standing next to Daniel, who was in fact the angel Gabriel, to explain it to Daniel. He said to Daniel, more in chapter, in verse 17 of chapter 8, mortal man understanding the meaning, the vision has to do with the end of the world. Chapter, in verse 18, while he was talking, I fell to the ground unconscious, this is Daniel, of course, but he took hold of me, raised me to my feet, and said, and I love this part, and the different translations make it even more just powerful for us, I am showing you what the, the result of God's anger will be. The vision refers to the time of the end. Skipping to verses 23 to 23, 26 of that same chapter, when the end of those kingdoms is near and they have become so wicked that they must be punished, there will be a stubborn, vicious, and deceitful king. He will grow strong, but not by his own power, he will cause terrible destruction and be successful in everything he does. He will bring, bring destruction on powerful men and on God's own people. Because he's cunning, 
He will succeed in his deceitful ways. He will be proud of himself and destroy many people without warning. He will even defy the greatest king of all, but will be destroyed without the use of any human power. This vision about the evening and the morning sacrifices, which has been explained to you, will come true. But keep it secret now, because it will be a long time before it comes true. Now Daniel fell very ill after interpreting this for the king. And still the people of the day truly did not understand what Daniel was talking about. And despite the clarity that Daniel had received from Gabriel, the point is that Daniel needed Gabriel's presence, actual presence to help him to do the work that God had in, intended him to do while he was being held by the kings of Babylon. Daniel was righteous, and it's mentioned in the Bible a few times that he was truly beloved by God. And it was so because of the choices Daniel made early in his life. Yet Daniel was still unclear as to the messages he had been receiving from God, so Gabriel was sent, as God would send his angels from time to time to deliver a message with great intensity and clarity. But why? Why indeed? God had deemed that Daniel would be his voice and declare to the Gentiles and to the Jews his eternal plans. Now, back to John's, um, as I call it, the car crash moment in Daniel 6 and verse 22 that John mentioned yesterday, we read about Daniel's experience in the lion's den. So Daniel 6 and verse 22, beginning there, King Darius, and I'll just set this up, King Darius was tricked by his own ministers, quite frankly, who were jealous of Daniel's success and sought his death by tricking the king into punishing Daniel for praying to his own God instead of just relying on the king as his mortal human king. But God protected Daniel. In verse 22, we read, My God sent his angel and shut the, the lion's mouth so that they could not hurt me because I have, found I have been found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. And the king rejoiced. And we know, as John had told us yesterday, Mr. Amorelli told us yesterday what the outcome was, so I won't go into that. Later, in, in, and you know, don't need to turn here now, but in chapter 9 and verses 20 through 26, Gabriel describes the, describes the destruction of the holy city. And most importantly, towards the end of that section, the actual murder of the Messiah that would, would, was to come. In chapter 10, which is, this is an interesting one, I think this is maybe a uh, a Bible study question that I will submit to um, Mr. Link and Mr. Harris in chapter 10. Gabriel uh, account, in, encounters a being who is very much described as John does in Revelation uh, as being someone who, with eyes of beryl, hair of white, clothed in, in white with a gold sash and feet of bronze. And it's uh, unclear as to whether whether this was an angel, Gabriel, perhaps, or whether this was Jesus Christ uh, encountering Daniel. But later on, it goes to say he touched Daniel, he touched Daniel and told him to be strong and to fear not, that God was with him. Interestingly, it was also mentioned to Daniel, and this is where maybe some of the, um, the question comes in, that um, he had fought together against the kings of Persia, along with Michael, the archangel, and seems clear that Jesus would not likely need the help of any archangel or any angel in doing fighting. Now, of course, we meet up again with Gabriel later on in the New Testament, and he appears to Zacharias, this is in the time of Herod, as a priest to inform him of the pregnancy of his wife Elizabeth. We all know this story. Elizabeth was a daughter of Aaron. Despite their advanced ages and that uh, Gabriel told them that a son would, would be born to them and he would be called John. Both Elizabeth and Zacharias were righteous people. The Bible tells, it, Bible tells us this, and they obeyed God and they were blameless in the eyes of God. Zacharias was concerned because of his age and that of his wife as well. Breaking in at chapter 1 of Luke, we're now in the New Testament in Luke, and in verse 18 we read, Zechariah asked the angel, 
Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not be able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. And I will stop at that, that section, at least for, for now. But after this, and, and Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months re remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she says in, in verse 25. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. Now, where else have we heard about the presence of, an, of the angel Gabriel? Many Christians um, who believe that they are believers are at least somewhat familiar with Luke's authorship of his book, of the, of the book of Luke, an important description of the birth of John the Baptist, and also the selection of Mary, betrothed to Joseph, who was in the house of David, to bear the child who was to be the Messiah, to bring him into the world as a baby who would grow into the man we know as Jesus Christ, our Lord, Savior, and coming King. Now we're still in Luke 1, but we are down in, in, um, in verse 26, and so you can turn with me there in Luke 1. And this is entitled, The Birth of Jesus Foretold. Now in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to a married man, to, to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. So clearly there was a plan there. The virgin's name was Mary. The way angel went on to say, greetings, you are highly favored. And this is what he said to Mary, the Lord is with you. Continuing on, Mary was greatly troubled at these words, as you can imagine, and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have been, you have been found to have favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and, will and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever, and his kingdom will never end, which obviously harkens back to Isaiah, one of my favorite books and, and sections in the Bible. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Mary's response I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word be fulfilled. And then the angel Gabriel left her. But I want to tie back now to the final point, the point of my sermonette and the title, Gabriel's Messages of Hope. Because it might seem that he came in times of, of stress and in times of, of challenge and trouble, but his messages were messages of great hope. Throughout time, and as recorded periodically in the Bible, messages from God would come in the form of a dream or a vision of source, but clearly there were moments that could simply not be left to human interpretation. I think of the voice across the river admonishing Gabriel to explain to Daniel the dream that the king experienced. As we know, Gabriel explained to Daniel that this illustrated the end of the world as we know it. This would be far too sobering a message to be deaf, left to Daniel alone. Gabriel's command, commanding presence and message was a necessity. What is common to these three appearances by Gabriel is that he was sharing dramatic and startling news. But Gabriel's main role, as we think about it, was sharing a message of hope, not of simply the destruction of the world as as they knew it and as we know it, not simply the end of a failed human existence and rule on earth, but the birth of the Baptist, and most important, the birth of the Messiah. Gabriel is the angel of hope in this case. Unlike Michael, who's clearly referred to as an archangel, a commander of angels, Gabriel, which is translated as God is my strength, he stood in the presence of God. This is what he told Daniel. God was familiar with Gabriel and appears to uh, consider him essential for the messages he would carry. But for a group of believers who would begin to grow through the centuries right up to this moment, 
for us here today, gathered together at the Feast of Tabernacles in 2020. We know of the messages that Gabriel carried, and we believe them. And we traveled many miles to be together to honor God's commandments because of those messages and their fulfillment. And that is what we are waiting for.